right? It had this crazy run up. And so I opened my Coinbase and there's all this money. And then I start seeing other people talking about crypto stuff. And I'm learning programming and I'm, I'm hoping I can get a programming job. But even that feels like it's going to be too slow because I want to not be worried about money when the baby's here. The simplest or the most robust, I think, understanding we have of happiness is just how consistently you are being in the moment, enjoying the moment with the people that you're around, not needing to be worried about the future, fearful of the future, regretting the past, constantly reminiscing on some better past, or distracting yourself from your present state through drugs or social media or TV or whatever. And part of that definitely came from going down this crazy crypto rabbit hole during the mania. Hey there, welcome to The Bounce Podcast. I'm Larry Weeks. Hope you're doing well. My guest on this episode is Nat Eliason. Nat is a writer and author of Crypto Confidential, winning and losing millions in the new frontier of finance. Since he started publishing his writing in 2013, his work has been read by millions of people and spun out multiple businesses ranging from a marketing agency to a tea cafe. Crypto Confidential is a wild story. In 2021, Nat set a six-month deadline to make as much money as possible before the birth of his first child, leading him to the world of cryptocurrency at the time. In just a year, he made millions writing code that managed hundreds of millions of other people's money, became an influencer in the space, speaking at DeFi conferences. Uh, he went through a platform hack. And despite amassing a small fortune, he started to question whether his wealth was truly secure and how long he could keep risking everything on the roller coaster investments his business was actually built on. So on the show, I talked to Nat about all of this. We go into that story. He reflects on his career shifts and eventual burnout in the business. We talk about his year-long process of recovering and his struggles to redefine his relationship with work and money. We discuss startup culture and the white knuckle mentality that sometimes it engenders. We discuss his writing and specifically his Substack post, which I encourage all of you to read and check out called This Moment Is Your Life, which explores his journey from a productivity focused mindset to embracing present moments and the paradox of enjoying life without constantly evaluating its worth. So we talk about that. We get into the world of cryptocurrencies. I ask him for some explanations and some more details. We talk about DeFi. He explains crypto trading, farming, and all the risk involved. I ask about the baby in the bathwater as to the real value of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the blockchain. And we talk about the challenges of pure productivity metrics. And we wrap up the conversation by exploring the connection or disconnect between money and happiness, as well as work-life balance. So lots of great life lessons here. In fact, we chat about the Ben Franklin quote, experience keeps a dear school and fools will learn in no other. I think we both disagree with the last part of that quote, but it is true that experience is a valuable but often costly teacher. And it's often the most effective way to truly understand and internalize lessons. So with that, I give you Nat Eliason. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thanks for having uh, me. Nat, the, I've gone down the rabbit hole of meditation and present, being present and all this. And then your post comes up and about being present. And I just saw a movie called Perfect Days. Have you seen this movie? I have not. Okay. Is it new or Do me fit? Yes. Well, 2023, okay. Wim Wenders made this movie. Okay. All it is, all it is, is about a toilet cleaner in Tokyo. Interesting. That's it. It's his life, but it's so much more than that. Huh. And it's late in his life. It just follows him in these days. But he is, <laughs> he, he's in the moment. It, yeah. I, it's just a stripped down movie that is like a meditation, honestly. I think it won some awards. Cool. I, I would love your opinion. But anyway, I, I say all that as preamble to say, then, then your post comes in and it's like, this is true. But at the same time, what do you do with that, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And it also it reminded me of Oliver Berkman's book, Four yeah. Thousand Weeks. Yeah, I had Fantastic I had book. him on the, I had him on the podcast. Cool. And 
it's really more insight. There's not, there's not a lot of productivity. And that was the whole point is like, look, you, you have a limit. You, you're only here for a certain amount of time. You better appreciate it and quit trying to bend time to your will and jam everything in. I talked to him and it was raw audio. I hadn't edited it yet. Mm -hmm. I go see my best friend from high school. I, and this guy was like a brother to me, my best friend. I see him. I meet Sunday. We talk. Talk Monday. He drops dead on Tuesday. Wow. And the title of the book, 4,000 Weeks, it, it's all about everything's finite, which is really yeah, yeah. My point is, I'm just letting you know where I'm coming from with this. Yeah. I, I, think, I think it's very important. It, what it looks like, some lessons you've learned and some reflections you have about life generally that dovetails into this, this, the, the story in the book. I, I think. Totally. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, let's do it. <laughs> cool. Let's do it. <laughs> Sorry. After a half hour of that, I want to push people to you. It's Substack, right? To, to subscribe. Yeah, Substack. Just, right. Yeah. And the, the Substack post is called This Moment is Your Life. Yeah. It, it seems you were writing it in reflection of the, the book that's coming out on, on your forays in, into the in crypto business and the manic way of living through, through that whole thing. How did this post come about and is it connected to what you went through with, with the crypto business? Yeah, I, I'd say it's a little connected. The, you know, the theme of the post is that the the simplest or the most robust i think understanding we have of happiness is just how consistently you are like being in the moment enjoying the moment with the people that you're around not needing to be worried about the future fearful of the future <clears throat> regretting the past constantly reminiscing on some better past or distracting yourself from your present state through you know drugs or social media or tv or whatever and part of that definitely came from going down this crazy crypto rabbit hole during the mania, you know, falling into what became this story and all these crazy events, and then getting so burned out and emotionally exhausted by that whole period that I feel like I ended up spending a year at least just trying to figure out how do I get back to a decent, like mental health state again, and exploring a lot of different avenues to get there. And what I eventually settled on was, or what I eventually found that was really effective, really effective was kind of like deep meditation and deep cultivation of that kind of like Zen present state awareness. And it really is remarkable what an impact that can have on your day-to-day -day life and how how much like just joy it can bring to the simplest experiences so but there just, is oh, so, sorry ahead. sorry you it, it it was a year process after you got out of the business yeah like almost maybe a year and a half probably so wow okay I mean, and you were it, yeah, go ahead. And, and, and really, a lot of the core of that, and this is something I've written about for years, and it's still a very interesting topic to me, was developing a healthier relationship with work. Because I'd say all of my work up until the last year and a half has been very defined by get as much money as I can as quickly as possible, because then I don't need to do these other things for like work to pay the bills and I can go do the other thing that I wanted to do, which was focus on writing. And I ended up kind of just like burning so hard on work during that period in crypto that I just came out of it totally exhausted and totally unable to work hard on anything, which was a challenging spot to be because as soon as I started to work hard, I almost had a a like very visceral deep reaction to it of fear or resistance or bad things are going to happen if I work this hard on something because the last times that I mm. got this crazy consumed with work, all this bad. Oh my, 
Oh my god. Mental gosh. health stuff came with it. So this is after so this is after you're out and then you take on another project and you're like yeah. you start to work hard and kind of PTSD or something it starts getting in my way, right? Of that feeling yeah, that I heard you. Yeah. I, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> um, th that's frustrating because then, you know, I, I had this ambition to do this book and to do additional books after it. And I would start pushing on it and then would pull back and try to push on it harder and keep pulling back and getting into these patterns of self sabotage and really had to struggle to redefine my relationship with my work and try to figure out how can this be very productive in a you know like producing great work sense not in a raw number of hours of the day sense and i can feel good about it and not be scared about it day to day and it took i think a while to really like suss that out yeah i remember i was part of a startup 07 through you know 2012 or, or so and then and there was war time you know it was it's yeah, kind of yeah. time foxhole thing. And I was shareholder and, but also we, we just came through, well, we went through that recession, that horrible recession and, and retailers were a part of our, the largest ones out there. Right. But, but they were clients. I'd look at the stock ticker just to see who was going to go out of business during that time. Right. And they, yeah. their circuit city went out. There was a lot of business that, that went oh, under. I remember circuit city. <laughs> but I remember just, just this, like you said, this, you just panic constantly, but also trying to reach an end, which is some liquidity event or, or yeah, yeah. M&A and that type of, which, which happened, which was great. Uh, but then I, I joined Google and then th that was almost kind of like a startup because we were part of a GTech, which is the innovative end of it, trying to mm -hmm. launch new stuff. But w when all that cleared and I, I left, I, I kind of had the same thing. I would take on a project, but, but I would have this white knuckle reaction. Yeah. And it was, it was very hard, but I read this quote by Naval Ravikant, mm -hmm. which said something like, somebody asked him, what would you tell your younger self? And it was, he would say, do everything you're going to do without the emotion, right? Mm. Because everything yeah. takes time. I, I'm, I'm probably butchering this, but I, I wrote that down just to try to, every time I would white knuckle something, I would try to back off and go, let me just this. This time, this is an experiment. Let me just try yeah. to do what I need to do without all this angst about, mm. is it going to succeed or not? Without the it urgency. Yeah. Hard. Yes. Without the white knuckling. It was very hard, but it did help me to back off. I, I, I would have to keep backing off. Not, not effort, right? Yeah. And that was the struggle. I thought I had to psychologically freak out or be at a 10 in order to have, to, to, to have some kind of effort into the right, work right in order for the yeah you're not actually trying if you're not super stressed out S some weird fucking yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> probably a relatable thing for a lot of people though uh, so can you relate to that is that yeah you yeah I, you know the the big thing that i really realized was how much of my sense of productivity and sense of Accomplishment is maybe not the right word, but my my judgment of whether I was successfully getting something done was so heavily metric driven. And yeah, you know, as somebody who's been doing a blog newsletter for eleven years now, has had you know Twitter for a while, and now I've got like Instagram and TikTok and YouTube and all this stuff. It's when you make something for those platforms, you get this immediate feedback you get the likes and the reposts and the comments or the emails and you're getting that validation that your work is good and that it was worthwhile to spend time on that and when i started working on the book the first six or eight months were just so brutal because i was working in the dark there was nothing that i was publishing from it and so I, you know, I, I went down this whole other rabbit hole of like starting an Instagram and a TikTok talking about books because I needed, I needed to make some number go up, like to feel good about myself, right? Because mm, yeah. that, that was just the relationship I had. And a big part of the reframing was learning how to give myself credit for making progress on something that 
is like a long, slow, compounding process. And, you know, Callan Newport had a couple of good pieces about this and his new book, Slow Productivity, talks about this a lot, about how if you, you know, if, if you if you work on a book, 2000 words or even 1000 words a day for six months, you might not have anything outwardly to show for it because you probably won't have the book done and published in those six months. But if you maintain that for two years, you might have one or two books out. You do that for five years and you could easily have four or five books out, 10 years, and you could have six to 10 books that are out. And an author who has published six to 10 books is a decently prolific author, right? But those are only like six to 10 things you have shipped in that time period, which feels really low when when you're hooked on the constant publishing of social media and stuff. But the one thing that I, I realized and I've really internalized is that the longer and slower and more intentionally you work on something, the longer it's also more likely to last and be valuable. Because these tweets that we're putting out in the world might get tons of engagement, tons of views, but then they're gone in two days. And it's extremely unlikely anybody will remember them, they'll probably never be referred back to, and they'll just be completely lost to time. I, I use this analogy a lot that, you know, Naval had had this wonderful era on Twitter where he was just dropping bangers left and right. And he was putting out all of these great thoughts. And that really would have been completely wasted if Eric Jorgensen hadn't written the Almanac of Naval and codified it into a book because all that stuff just disappeared. You know, it's it's really hard to go back and reread all that. You could like scroll through his it gets feed, pushed but down. it's a pretty, it, it, just it gets, gets pushed in, down. Infinite, yeah. Just Yeah, it's, it's not being surfaced for you. And, you know, I, I've had a few different careers now over the last eight or nine years, I had the SEO on my blog, I, you know, launched an app, I had a marketing agency, I worked in crypto, obviously. And each time, I could get started really quickly and get these quick wins. And then, you know, start making money from it, and it would go well. But a couple of years later, I would be bored of it, because I was mostly doing it for the money. And then I would kind of quit and move on to something else Then I was starting from zero. So it's really this question of, What's something I could work on that could last a really long time once I'm done with it? And books are a wonderful version of that. And what's something that I would be happy to wake up and work on it every day, even if I'm not getting that validation and that social reward for doing it. And for me, that it, it really came down to writing. Like writing was the thing. And I just had to tweak this one bit of my relationship with it, the being giving myself credit for writing 2000 words or editing 4000 words, even if nobody sees it like that's enough, that's still being productive, like I won that day. Yeah, you, you want to play a, the infinite game, right? Yeah, the, the, the... you know, I obviously I have to make money, I have kids. And you know, my wife and I both work and I, I need this to be financially lucrative. But I also think that the best way it becomes financially lucrative is by it being something that I can keep grinding on and improving at every single day and knowing that it might take three, four, five years to get to where I want it to get to. It doesn't have to happen right away. And that's a key point because yeah. projects like that, money comes at the end of them down yeah. the road. Yeah. It, it, as you say, when you bang out a page or two, there's no money. Right until yeah. <laughs> unless unless you get in a I'm sorry unless you've got yeah you have an advance, advance if you yeah get a, yeah know. so but but for most people the creative projects you have to love them for themselves even if you have money in mind as to what it's going to do otherwise yeah you're gonna be very very unhappy because they, that money is deferred for most people on creative projects till till after it's done so there's and even that as frame. an author yeah, yeah yeah and even as an author you can take a strategic business approach to it because I was talking about this with my agent, because I'm really interested in fiction writing too. And I'm two drafts into a sci fi novel, and I'm loving doing that. 
and he's he's going to help me sell that probably later this year. But the thing he told me is he said, you know, I just want to warn you. He's like, your advance for this, even if it's good, will probably be way lower than your advance for nonfiction. But if a fiction book does well, it can just dramatically outsell a nonfiction book. It's this, you know, writing is already a power law. Well, it's and a mass audience, writing, right? It's, yeah, yeah. Fiction writing is this whole other power law right. beyond nonfiction. And he's like, so you could almost think of nonfiction as like your day job where it's a little bit more steady income. You can sell a nonfiction book deal every 12, 18, 24 months. You've got an audience. You'll get, you know, a good advance for it and you can keep doing that. And then you also do this fiction stuff, which your advance might only be like 10, 20, 30 K, but if one hits and it sells 10 million copies, suddenly you've got this like crazy success on your hands too. So this is, this is very interesting because, and, and I want to, again, I'm going to point people to the post and then the, the, your book. I have this quote in, in the post on the, this moment is your life where you reference your other post when the money's too damn good which yeah. was a reflection of how severely the, the quick wins of working in crypto had warped your relationship with money, time, and work. In that post, there's some great, great quotes. You say, it, it took a while for me to realize that all this other work was originally to support being able to write. Um, and so you started an agency so you can write. You went into crypto because you were scared of not making enough money to write. But then you forgot about that. And yeah. And then there's this success can be its own failure. And and that's what ended up kind of scaring you about crypto. You said it was it was absolutely totally corrupting. Very fun. Exclamation mark. But it fucked with Very your fun. head. <laughs> <laughs> so crypto confidential, your experience yeah, yeah. there. I think the catalyst is your wife's pregnant, right? You had about six months to to make some money before the baby is born. I, and I think that was the trigger or the goal. So this is sometime in 2021. You, you, and, and so crypto came up as your opportunity. Is that right? Yeah. So okay. basically, I, I, had, I had gotten decently interested and involved in crypto in 2017. Didn't go anywhere, got bored, went on to other things when the market crashed. But I set up these automatic weekly buys in Coinbase where it would just buy $100 of Bitcoin every week, whatever the market price was. And that had ran from 2017 until the end of 2020 and the start of 2021. And I was trying to figure out, you know, I, I, I didn't want to do the SEO content marketing anymore. I'd been doing that for a while. I was really burned out on it. And I'd always enjoyed programming. So I was trying to learn programming. And then at the same time, crypto is just starting to take off. I'm starting to see it on Twitter, see it on the news again. And I go and I check my Coinbase and it's this like, holy shit moment. Cause I had no idea that there was all this money in there. It was like $80,000 or something. I would not put anywhere close to that into it, but just by buying a little bit each week through the whole drop in the market, it had turned into this, you know, pretty crazy sum, right? It's like the Bitcoin went down to 4k, I think after 2017 at one point, and then in 2021, it went up to 69K, right? It had this crazy run up. And so I open my Coinbase and there's all this money. And then I start seeing other people talking about crypto stuff. And I'm learning programming and I'm, I'm hoping I can get a programming job. But even that feels like it's going to be too slow because I just want to, I want to not be worried about money when the baby's here. And even, you know, if I can't get a programming job in time, then I could at least go try to figure this crypto stuff out and see where it gets me. And had, you know, one friend who was really into the space, thankfully, who could kind of give me some initial pointers and then end up falling down this, what turns out to be a pretty crazy rabbit hole. And in, in April, May, when the book starts, I've got this initial bit I can gamble with, and I'm getting really excited about making a couple hundred dollars a day here and there, right? Trying to figure this game out. and then by December, I'm working with this team. I've been doing a bunch of crypto programming for them. I've helped launch their token and people have put over a hundred million dollars into this thing <laughs> and it's being secured by like the code that I wrote. And so I'm well, hang, hang on. Know. They're putting, they're, they're putting, they're putting tokens or they're putting money into this, this exchange, this DeFi platform. 
or yeah so not exactly an exchange but basically you know it, it was a the idea was a crypto video game so if anybody's played like world of warcraft or runescape or diablo or any kind of online rpg where your character levels up and it gets better gear and then it can fight tougher and tougher monsters and you can trade that gear with other people the idea and this is going to happen somebody's going to do this and it's going to be great but the idea was that all of that should be tradable within a crypto economy so if you're playing and you get this incredible sword or piece of armor you should be able to sell that for the game currency gold or whatever but then you should also be able to trade the game's currency for usdc or eth or some other crypto asset so that you're it actually would be fractional able to... or micro payments or something totally yeah it'd be tiny tiny payments that you could basically do for no transaction fee and then if you're playing this game a ton and you get bored and want to quit you can sell all the stuff that you collected and earned in the game and actually cash out the work you did which is is this it, it's pretty interesting because there have been a few attempts at doing this you know second life was this big multiplayer almost like experience more than game where people actually had jobs and they did things and you could you could get money out of the system and then you had other games like world of warcraft where they explicitly banned selling items for real world money and if they caught you doing it they would ban you and but people did it anyway people would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on items and accounts and then that had recurred through a bunch of other games so there was there's always been this demand to be able to use real money to get a leg up in games we see that in mobile games now people will pay microtransactions to speed up in the game but the other side of it hasn't been done very well which is people can put money into the game to get stuff but they can't then sell that stuff to bring money back out and it's remarkable that the economy in these games is as big as it is considering you can't do that you look at a game like Fortnite, and people spend billions of dollars a year like with a b billions on cosmetic items just to make their character look different that give them no benefit in the game beyond just status signaling or appearance or um you know like something that they're just excited to show off to their friends and so how big do these game economies get when it is fully composed with the broader internet economy and when you can easily bring your money between all of these games or when your one gamer tag like Nataliasin shows your rare items across all of the games you play. I mean, that's it's definitely coming and it's going to be a huge deal when it does. And this team was trying to do one of the early versions of it. So were I was you, working with them. Were mm -hmm. you doing so? So I read your book, but I, I don't know when the crypto farming started in, yeah. in this particular. I, I, I don't know if there's this what it. I don't know if it's important if the sequence did you get into farming first or this particular application um, so the first thing you know when i when i saw crypto was going crazy and i wanted to get in and i wanted to make a lot of money i started with the same thing that most people start with which is day trading where i was on robin hood and coinbase trying to buy and sell doge to like you know okay. sell the top buy That's the bottom and right and stack that way realized that was just way too risky i had no edge there so then i got into farming which was this process of finding new projects that were launching in crypto going in and using them when they launch because if you used these projects early on they would reward you with tokens and so you could collect as many of their tokens as possible and then sell them to other people who were trying to collect their tokens to earn more tokens it was kind of like a a is this like chicken. a saving? Is this like a? I, I was trying to, because yeah, I, yeah, I don't know that much about crypto farming, so I was trying to come up with an analogy. Or is it kind of like a savings account where you put money in, the bank pays you interest, and this is the bank's way of rewarding you for letting them use your money to, for things like loans to other customers. Is it yeah. anything near that? Okay. Yes. So that is what it is in the best case. So in the, in the, <laughs> and this, this is an important uh, distinction. Well put, um, well put. So there, there are, there are crypto applications like Aave, A-A-V-E, where you can deposit your Ethereum or your wrapped Bitcoin or your USDC or these other crypto assets. 
and then you can borrow against them. So you can deposit Ethereum and you can borrow USDC. And then you have to pay interest in USDC as long as you as long as you're borrowing it. Other people are also supplying ETH and USDC, which is how you're able to borrow from the application. And so if you are supplying USDC, you're getting paid the interest that I'm paying by borrowing it. And then so you're making some money, right? Just by putting it in the platform, just like a savings account, right? It's kind of like the bank is lending out your money and paying you some interest. But then on top of that, an application like Aave might say, okay, you're making 5% on your USDC because other people are borrowing it and paying you that interest. We're going to pay you an additional 2% in Aave tokens as a thank you for using our platform. And that's how they get their token out in the wild. And that's really common. That's really normal. It's a great way for platforms to get their tokens out. It's a great way for them to incentivize new users because you know a platform like Aave now has, I think, $20 billion worth of crypto deposited in it, a ton of money. And if you're just starting out and you need to compete with that, the best way to get people to move their money from Aave to your new lending platform is to say, Aave is only paying you 2% in Aave tokens. You come to Bank of Net and I'll pay you 10% in net tokens. And it's a way to get people to bring their money over to your platform. Okay. So you're... some go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Go so I was going to say that that's where it's good, right? That's the the relatively wholesome version of this. Some people saw that and they said, "Well, it doesn't really matter, you know, if you just wanted to try to make as much money as quickly as possible, you could make another copy of Ave." and say that if you put USDC in here or ETH or whatever, we'll pay you 100% or 200% in our tokens. And that'll really, really attract a ton of people to come in. But when you're giving away that many tokens, people are going to sell them a lot more aggressively. You're going to have these crazy peaks and drops in the value of your token. So, and if you're just giving your token away, and it doesn't seem like you're going to have a very competitive application, there's no reason for people to hold your token. They're just going to go sell it. So you have to come up with a reason for people to keep holding your token and not immediately dump it. So you add another incentive on top. You say, you put in your USDC and we'll pay you 100% in our tokens. But if you then put in our tokens as well, so take all the tokens we're paying you, redeposit them, we'll pay you 400% or 1000% on our own tokens. So you can compound our tokens faster and faster and faster, the longer you keep your money in here. And that's what these more degenerate Ponzi like farms were doing. I was gonna say, were, it's Ponzi or Tulip. Kind yeah, of. it's okay. the whole idea is it's basically a giant game of chicken, which is how long can we all keep our tokens in to drive up the value of the coin by nobody selling and for us all to accumulate more and more of these tokens before people start selling in large numbers and crash the price. So you would have these platforms that launched and within a day of launch, there would be a hundred million dollars in them and the token price would be going parabolic. It'd be going crazy, but then it would hit a tipping point and everybody would start selling the tokens really aggressively, trying to cash out their winnings. The price would just crater, go through the floor. All the tokens you earned would be basically worthless. And then everybody would pull their money out and go on to the next farm. And you were you, because I'm, I'm reading the book and, and you're talking about this type of thing. By the way, I, I'm pushing people to the book because you, you also, it's kind of an educational, it has an educational aspect because you have blocks of yeah. explaining blockchain, crypto, Bitcoin, you know, you, you go through the story, but you also try to explain to the novice. 75% fun, high pace action, yeah. thriller story, 25% little educational sidebars. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's parsed well. But did you know all this going in? And be, because there is that manic looking like at a stock ticker or looking at things taking off or crashing, yeah, and I, I I'm assuming the the emotional roller coaster, the the panic, the euphoria and panic is <laughs> like a roller yeah. coaster. I'm assuming. Oh yeah, I I didn't realize that's what was going on at first. Okay. In the beginning, 
I just thought these were other new projects that were launching that had better incentives. And it took playing in them a couple of times to really understand that none of these launches had any intention of building a real product. It was just a casino game for people who already had money in crypto who wanted something to play. Were you and, betting, sorry, sorry, Nat, were you kind of betting on, hey, this token may take off or this cryptocurrency may be the next big thing? I'm just trying to simplify next, this. Yeah, yeah, next big thing for at least a short period. Okay, all right. Right, like this could be the, the next big thing for the next week or month. You know, right. you have no idea at how At some point you knew there was a shelf life. You knew there was yes. a shelf, okay, got it. You pretty much know that most of these have to go to zero because there isn't a serious product behind them. So it's a question of, you know, how much money can you make in the interim is kind of the game. Are you seeing people before you got involved, like making incredible amounts of money? And did you know these people and were you like, geez, I, I can code or Jesus. How, yeah. What are well, these that, guys that's what pulled doing? me into it. Yeah. I, I, okay. I kept seeing on Twitter, these people who I kind of knew posting their winnings or how much this token that they got in early that had gone up. And I was looking at, it, I said, there has to be a trick to doing this. And that's what pulled me into the farming and trying to figure out, you know, okay, how, how is this working? And at the end of the day, the, the main way that you do well is by knowing what's coming out before anybody else does. So if you're Just finding like stuff any on, other yeah, advantage. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you're, if you're finding stuff on Twitter or Telegram yep. broadcasts, you're late, you're the exit liquidity, you're the money they want to come in and buy it when it's at the top so that they can all sell their position. You basically have to be in these secret little group chats where they decide where to point the large amounts of money initially or where they're really closely following where people are putting their money so that they know the second new things launch. If you're not at that end of the information timeline, you're probably mostly losing money. So for a while, the goal was how close to the source of information on these things can I get? Because the closer to that I get, the higher chance I have to make money. But eventually, I sort of decided that you can make money farming. Just like, you know, today, there's not as much of that farming metagame. It's a lot right now. It's meme coins. It's all these crazy tokens on Solana usually, but they'll probably be on base soon too. But even with those, it's still a, you know, how close to these things launching can you get and how high confidence can you have that it's going to last a week, a month, a year, whatever. But I decided that was just a really risky way to try to make money because you could make negative money, right? If you, if you come in to that game with $10,000 or $100,000, and you make the wrong bets, you could lose all of it. So it's not in and my none mind, of this was regulated. None of this. Oh no, no, yeah. no. And it's still not really. I mean, the the rules on it are are really unclear. The the people who launch these things definitely run the risk of getting sued, and some of them have been. And I suspect there will there will be many more lawsuits for people doing things that are outright scams. But you, as a participant. You know, there's there's no regulation, there's no rules. If they take all the money and run, there's not really anything you can do about it. You just say like, okay, I lost that one. Let's find the next thing. And that was kind of the game. And I just decided that that aspect of or that type of trying that way of trying to make money in crypto was just way too risky and not worth pursuing seriously. And that's when I got into doing more of the programming because there all these serious teams that were actually trying to build real products, not these gambling farms. Like they the all game, needed like the game for example. like the game exactly okay. it was a real project they were you know earnestly trying to build a really cool crypto game trying to do new stuff with crypto that i was really excited about and didn't see anybody doing and so i was like yeah i should try to work with somebody like that because if you work with a team like that and you get paid in some of their token and the game does really well those tokens could be worth a lot of money and it was there were so few people who knew how to code tokens and how to code or how to set up like making their token tradable on these decentralized exchanges and how to handle that part of it that it was a really really in demand skill set and it paid incredibly well if you knew how to do it and so i ended up shifting all of my energy to just learning that kind of programming specifically so i could land one of those jobs so and, and the book goes through this in a lot more detail but like you said it's great because you did, by the way did were you journaling during this time because, or just reflect when you wrote the book, did you just reflect back and go? The, the, the really fortunate thing is that 
almost everything in this time period happened on Discord and text message. So, so you have a you had a trail of I had a trail, yeah. yeah. E even even though I wasn't, you know, I, I had no intention of writing this book when I got into it. I mm -hmm. I had no idea that all this stuff was going to happen. But then after it after it all did, and I decided, hey, there is probably a good story here. I was able to just read through all of my Discord chats for the last year and a half and pull out all the important pieces, the important story ele elements. And so like, you know, in the book, anytime there's something that's like a text message or a Discord chat, it's almost always verbatim what was said in those messages, which is pretty cool because most people doing a memoir style book can't do that. They have to completely reconstruct the conversations from memory. But I had this pretty detailed log of almost everything that happened through that time period. So is this a year, 18 months? What What's the begin and end of the your journey? The bulk, the bulk of it is like April 21 to March 22. Wow. So yeah, not much longer. So are, are we talking? So what was life <laughs> like? Well, I mean, are you seeing that you're making digitally millions? Like, yeah. I, I think you sold what a digital some kind of was it NFT yeah, for two hundred thousand or something? Yeah, yeah. You know, I you know I I got really into the DeFi and the gaming side of crypto during that area and or during that era. And one of my best friends got really into the NFTs, and he was doing all this crazy NFT trading. And I was watching that, and I was thinking that is so cool. But I don't want to go learn that because I want to learn just how to code. And so I asked him. I was like, you know, if I was just going to buy one NFT. Do you think it should be a board ape? Do you think those are going to go up? And when I asked him that, they were trading at three or four Ethereum. And he said, yeah, I guess if you're just going to buy one thing and sit on it, that would probably be the one to get. And so I bought it for four ETH, which was like $8,000 at the time. And then two or three months later, it at sort of the first peak of the board ape yacht club euphoria, I was able to sell it right at the top of that peak for 61 ETH. So it was a 15x return basically but ethereum had also gone up and so it was like hundred and ninety thousand dollars for this nft just off of that that one trade in that period which was more you know i, I had originally gone into it thinking okay if i can make like 150k then we could be pretty set for the next like year or two while i get like these programming jobs and suddenly i'm making way more money than that and so the goalpost keeps moving and moving and moving. And I need like, let's go higher. Let's go higher. It's okay. It's not just this 150K. Now it's, I could make enough to have like a moderate living, you know, like a good living in downtown Austin forever, right? If I get seven and a half million dollars or something like that. But now you have that's the, like, the, now you have the kind of the gambler mindset of, yes, I, I just won the pot. You know, what if I double this? You know, like, what if right? I double down? Keep doubling, right. keep doubling, Is, keep going for more. What are you mentally, are you aware that you're, of, of what's happening in your head? Or is, I, I, was this a calculated risk? I mean, were you doing the math saying, okay, I'll, <laughs> I mean, how much of this <laughs> is, wish. how much of this, right. I was going to say, how much of this is riding the bull versus, you know, you know, walking the horse kind of a thing where, you know, I, I, I guess you have no control to a degree. You're just riding a wave of you know euphoria right i yeah i mean i i i had more i thought i had more control than i did because around the time that a couple of those big wins started happening i was also this part didn't make it as much into the book unfortunately because i had to i just didn't have space for it but i was writing a lot more blog posts and tweeting a lot more and talking about crypto more and was starting to get an audience in the space and people were starting to read my writing and look at what I was so talking that's another, about. So that's another kind of dopamine hit. Not only the yeah. money, but now you're you're increasing your reach, your exposure. Mm -hmm. and, and people are now starting to let me into captured, those, private, yeah. those private chats. They're starting to tell me about things before most people are finding out about them. And so in my head, I'm going, if I was able to get to this point when I was an outsider, how much further can I go as an insider? You know, I, I actually have the secret knowledge now. Like I, I know what's coming. I, I can do, I can go even bigger. I can do even better. Right. And, you know, getting invited to like angel invest in projects and getting early access to things in the hopes that I'll write about them on my blog and starting to 
see behind the matrix more and more and just getting more and more confident that, you know, not only is this going to keep going up, keep, you know, just going up for years and years, but I'm getting more skill and knowledge in the space. And so I'll make even more as I continue to focus on it. Mm. So, you know, there, there was, there was none of the, none of the fear of it falling apart or what I'd say, like, or what I call respect for the money, because as soon as it came in, I would just redeploy it into new things on the hopes of making it bigger and bigger. So it didn't seem, I, I'm sorry, based on what you just mm -hmm. said, that you're saying since it was all virtual, right, digital, maybe it didn't seem real anyway, so it, I could yeah, play with it. Yeah, it didn't seem it. real at all. Okay, got it. Yeah, got I mean, you're, I'm, I'm looking at these numbers on the screen and it's like, okay, now I've got these 60 ETH and this other NFT is four ETH, but if that four ETH becomes, you know, 10 ETH and I've got another two and a half X, at no point am I thinking you know, the the one mental exercise I eventually went through that did kind of save me was imagine that all of this ETH and other tokens are actually cash in my living room. Would I take twenty thousand dollars of that cash and put it into this NFT? It's, there's no way in hell. I don't think no way. So I, no. I think that's the problem to to me. The problem with Robinhood and other platforms that oh yeah, it's too easy. To, it's too easy. It's, it's just so digital. Easy. It's like a mm -hmm. video game, or, or it's, I'm sorry, exactly. it's like a mobile a game on your, well, it is. Yeah, it's game it is. A video, it so, feels just like a video game. But you're just, it's just digits. They doesn't seem real. There's no way yeah. if there were gold bars sitting in your, yeah. And it made me completely yeah. out of touch. Yeah, I, I had no respect for the money that I had That's earned. interesting. That is a great and, statement. And just, yeah, yeah. And, you oh. know, I, it, and I'm i very grateful that I went through that experience at a relatively young age because, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty hardworking, motivated person. I suspect at some point in my life I'll come into serious, you know, earnings in one way or another. And having had this experience now, it just, it'll be a totally, hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> totally yeah. different relationship with the money. I just, yeah. looking I, back, I couldn't believe how quickly it took over. That's interesting insight, Nat, because I was just thinking, so I have a friend of mine, we played tennis together. This guy's a ex partner of a law firm and he is old school cash. He's just yeah. cash out. And the guy's got a lot of money, but I was, I was doing something for him. And when he paid me, he just pulled out a wad of bills <laughs> or just, just like just thick bunch of yeah. money that he gave me. Right. And I'm, and I'm using it for restaurants. So I, because it's so thick, instead of pulling out my card, which I normally do, I, I'm starting to use the, but man, it's making me realize how much I'm paying for dinners. I know right. I'm paying, I know, I am looking at the bill, but it is so different mm -hmm. when I'm paying with cash. Yeah. I'm like, holy shit, this is an expensive meal, even yeah. though I see it, even though I see it's it different. on the bill and I sign. Yeah. It's totally different. Yeah. I really, it, I've heard that before as a very simple means of budgeting is to just pay for everything in all cash because yeah when you when you're actually handing over the bills it's a very different experience than you know boop, tap your phone and twelve dollars a hundred dollars whatever is gone exactly so when was the and, and forgive my use of language here but when was was there a wake-up call was there just fear or was did you see the writing on all what what was the come to Jesus moment of I got to get out yeah and <clears throat> go ahead there there were there were a couple of important realizations the first one was when i started working with this team for the game they hadn't been able to pay me in dollars or eth or anything else they they could only pay me in their game token and I I assumed it wasn't really going to be worth anything and you know like maybe it would do well but I wasn't counting on that at all and I figured okay I'll, I might make a little money off of this but it will it'll be it, it'll be great experience for me to go work with a, a bigger and more established team that can actually give me a real salary so they agreed to pay me these tokens and the tokens would unleash would release over the course of a year you know some releasing every day every day every day and in the, for the first few months it was a good amount of money. It was like a couple hundred dollars a day, but it wasn't enough that I had to like seriously think about what to do with it. And I just kept reinvesting it into the game. 
And then it got to this point where suddenly it was a couple thousand dollars a day. The token starts going up and it's, you know, every day I'm rolling over and I'm hitting a button on my keyboard to claim my payment for that day. And it might be like $2,000 or $3,000 in their game tokens. And I'm talking to another friend and I'm trying to decide, do I hold on to all of this, try to sell it at the peak? Do I sell a little bit now and reinvest the rest? Do I sell all of it now? And he made two really good points. You know, one was that the the actual trading liquidity, the actual funds moving around on a lot of these tokens, they might the token might on paper be worth a hundred million dollars for all of the tokens, but there might only be one or two million dollars of trading liquidity for the token. So if the team tried to sell all of the tokens at once, they wouldn't get a hundred million dollars. They would get one or two million. So they're actually worth a lot less than you think they are because the market can move so quickly with large sells. And so he said, you basically have to start selling some right away because you'll never be able to sell all of them if you wait. And that, that was really helpful. And the other thing that he said that I hadn't thought of was that there are like all of these unknown insider trading rules with working for these crypto companies where by working for the team, you have insider knowledge on what's going on with them. You know when new features are launching, when press is coming out, if something bad happens. And if you make a bunch of trading decisions based off that knowledge, that could maybe be seen as an insider trading thing, right? That could, that could be a concern. And so it's actually better to do what big CEOs of public companies do, which is sell Just plan, a schedule. plan to start, yeah, yeah. Plan, Just right? Just do something really consistent so that you're not overly influenced by information that you might have access to. And so doing that, you know, I just started selling some every day and that ended up, you know, saving me because, you know, the token ran up to $13 at one point. It started at 10 cents, went up to $13, and now it's worth 2 cents. <laughs> and it was at $13 for a day, right? And, you know, dropped down after that. And so the, it, timing everything in there would have been impossible. But the other really big wake-up call was towards the end, or not towards the end, but like, around February, March of 22, I've been so deep in this. I've been, you know, claiming these payments from the game. I've been doing all this, these other shenanigans. And I, I saw, I think, I think Nick Majuli wrote something about this, or he tweeted about it. His blog is of dollars and data, which is really good, basically about having target asset allocations within your net worth. So if you just hold index funds, you might not have to worry about it. But if you do real estate and index funds and you know private market investing and crypto there's no index for all of that so you need to know that you want to be say 30 percent indexes 20 percent real estate 10 percent crypto however you want to split it up and i said oh that's interesting you want an allocation exactly, yeah. that makes sense okay. some sort of target and that you might have to rebalance you know you might have to sell things to get back to your balance if you're super overweighted especially in a crazy bull market I'm sure a lot of people are thinking about this with like NVIDIA right now, right? And I, I went and I did the math and I had 70% of my net worth in crypto. <laughs> it was worth, you know, way more than our house, all of my retirement funds, all of my index funds, all the cash, everything. And I didn't, I wasn't sure what the target should be, but that was clearly way too high. That was just dangerously high. And that was in March of 22, which was a couple months before things got really ugly. And I just started selling pretty aggressively then, not as aggressively as I would have liked, but more aggressively. And that ended up saving me some from what became a much worse crash later in the year. So I want to ask you what two question categories. One mm -hmm. is, where's the baby in the bathwater of crypto, whether that's Bitcoin, Ethereum? Or, or is it just blockchain technology in general? Because yeah. um, I've been skeptical this whole time. I certainly understand blockchain, I, but I, okay, it's a cool technology, block, but things are digital already. And, and unless the government adopts that kind of a system, there's monetary policy, there's interest rates. There are things that it's... Um, not connected to that to me puts it at risk or if it doesn't put it at risk it makes it less valuable because it's not connected to the general economy which seems to be the point this is this is going to be 
we're not pegged to anything. You know, if a government falls apart, you know, it's free floating. The, 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 the things that it seem to portray it as uh, valuable also seem to, to me, make it risky or mm -hmm. not very valuable. I, I hope I'm making sense. No, totally. Okay. And so I with think this that, experience, yeah, where have you where have you landed in 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 the world of Bitcoin, the whole nine yards? Yeah. So you know, I, I think like Bitcoin's obviously the best place to to start with this. And you know, when Bitcoin first launched, there probably wasn't much of a reason to believe that it could ever become a a serious store of value. You know, you could have been a true believer, but that would have been mostly based off of faith and excitement, not, you know, grounded in some serious proof that it would become that. But, you know, Bit the great thing about Bitcoin is that it's it's so simple, right? It it basically does one thing. It, the, the Bitcoin blockchain tracks which wallets hold how much Bitcoin, it lets you send and receive them. And yes, there's other stuff that's sort of being built on top of that, but that's like the main thing. And so it can argue, and then, and then because the inflation curve is fixed in stone and it would only change if everybody or more than half of the people who are fully invested in Bitcoin decided to devalue it, which they'll never do. You know, we know exactly how many of them there are going to be. There's no way to fudge the numbers. There's no way to wipe them out, take them away. You could hold them on a uh, on a sentence of words purely in your brain and, and nobody could take it away from you, right? And so in that sense, it is kind of like a an upgrade to gold where gold also has all of those properties. You could hold it, you could take it around with you, but it's very hard to send across borders or to even like fractionalize and give to people. It's very hard to, you know, borrow against it if you're holding a large amount of it. It is kind of this ideal technology for providing a provably scarce store of value. And so that it, it has it has that potential and has always had that potential. And I think every year that goes by that nothing bad happens to it and that more people hold it and think of it that way, the stronger that story gets. But I'm pretty much of the mind that that is like a that is still a 20 to 50 year journey from here because it's not going to seem obvious and ubiquitous unless you truly were born in the Bitcoin era. So, you know, it, it started in 2009, started to become more known in like 2013, 2017. And so even for me, you know, I'm a millennial, I'm 31. A lot of people in my age group, there's still this like hesitancy with it because, you know, I remember time before Bitcoin. I remember when it was like just gold, I was young, but I remember it. And for people, you know, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, it's still this like very new thing. But you think about somebody who's Gen Z, somebody who's 18 today, somebody who's 12 today, they've never known a financial world where Bitcoin wasn't an option for how they store their money. And nothing bad has happened with it. There's been no reason to think it's less secure than gold through that time period. So for them, it's going to just become a very natural, I think, part of how they hold on to some of their wealth, especially given its inflation protective advantages, considering they grew up and are going through what could be another era of high inflation. So I think Bitcoin has started to establish itself as actually providing some real value there. And it's cool that now with the ETFs, you can hold it in a very financialized way. You can just have it in your Vanguard account as an ETF and you can borrow against it and it still has all of the same, you know, inflation protected like backed properties to it, but you don't have to deal with a wallet and private keys, whatnot, or you can go full, you know, self custody, have it in that sentence in your brain and you're completely, you've got that part of your wealth completely protected from the digital financial system. Like being able to be anywhere on that spectrum is actually really cool. And I think that's a really exciting advancement for it. So I think that's kind of like, the Bitcoin case, and I'm pretty fully bought in on that continuing to be some part of our way that we allocate our portfolios in the world. And, you know, for some people it might be 1%, some people it might be 10%. I know plenty of people where it's 80 or 90%, right? Like everyone's going to have a different risk profile with it. But then it's like, okay, well, what about everything else? Because there's thousands of cryptocurrencies out there. So 
do any of those have any reason to exist? And the only one that at this point, I feel like, well, I'll, I'll make a caveat here. There, there, are, there are things like stable coins, like USDC that are different from these like actual blockchain tokens. So I'll get to those in a second. But the only other blockchain that I'd say I have like nearly as close of confidence to having some place in this world is Ethereum because it provides this financial layer that Bitcoin doesn't. You can't really do, you know, derivatives and stocks and lending and borrowing and all these other financial tools that we rely on in the modern economy on Bitcoin. You would need to just have Bitcoin in the existing financial system, but you can actually rebuild the current financial system on Ethereum. You can have a full banking suite on it where you're, you receive your paycheck in USDC, a coin pegged to the US dollar. You put that in a savings account to earn some interest. You buy a tokenized version of the Vanguard index fund or whatever else you want to invest in. And that's in like a retirement account and all that's running on the Ethereum blockchain. And BlackRock has talked really explicitly about wanting to do this because they see it as the next era of the current financial system of getting all the tokenized, putting it on chain, and right now, most of that work is being done on Ethereum just because it has the most robust security layer. It has the most people working on it. It's been around the longest, been the most proven, and it's actually pretty fully decentralized in a way that no one company can fully control or influence it. So those two, I have very high confidence, are here for the long term at this point and have a reason to exist. <clears throat> so something like, Solana need to exist to fill in the faster paced consumer transaction layer. Unclear because there are a lot of other ways to do that, like on Ethereum. Do these coins like Dogecoin need to exist? I mean, no, they're just fun to speculate on and are entertaining, but you don't, know, I'd have a, I couldn't make a case that that's going to be a thing in 20 years. But given how much of the financial world is starting to adopt Bitcoin and Ethereum and actually build things on them that could become mass consumer applications and normal ways that we interact with our money day to day, I would be pretty confident that they're here to stay at this point. It's a, it's, it's kind of a technology infrastructure. Ethereum, uh, especially future. It is, yes, yeah, yes. So, that, so that's providing the new tech layer for yes. the financial world. Yes. So, because when I think of Bitcoin as a store of value, I, I, I understand limited supply, what have you, but, but I also think there's a, kind of a hero skew risk. I mean, there's probably hmm. people of, that are holding so much Bitcoin that if they cashed out, I can't imagine what would happen to the, the value of it, unless there's that much more buyers in the wing. You know what I mean? I, I think that was a really big concern for a long time, and that's gone down pretty considerably oh, in the last okay. like year or two. The, those coins still exist. You know, the Satoshi wallets, I think have over a million Bitcoin in them. I haven't checked the number in a while. And so if they, you know, if if that person or persons are still active and could access those coins and sell them, that would be bad and it would drive the price down, but it wouldn't really jeopardize the project because there are so many, I mean, there are nation states, there are massive financial institutions. BlackRock has said they're trying to own 15% of the Bitcoin supply. That's what I mean. So there, there are buyers yeah. in the market ready Who to absorb that liquidity totally. Yeah. Right. Got it. Okay. So let's get back to your kind of lessons learned here. And again, juxtaposing the, this moment is your life. Yeah. And yeah. Here's the crazy moments that were my life in this cryptocurrency thing. Could you have come to the inside of that post, this moment is your life? And, and the insight is, Hey, look, this is my life. And if I postpone it, if I'm waiting for something in the future, I'm wasting my life now. Or if I'm waiting to earn enough money, so then I could live my life. I'm wasting my mm -hmm. life. I'm, by the way, I'm, that's my interpretation, right? But did you have to go through the crypto thing to have this insight? And if you had the insight or it was solidified in, in your mind, would you have done the crypto thing? These, these are terrible yeah. questions. No, yeah. no, I, I, Do you understand I understand what, what you're asking. Okay. Yeah, yeah, which is, could I have skipped the experience and internalized that lesson from the get-go? And I, I don't think, like, I, I think that this is actually yeah. Ben one Franklin of the said, you know, experience keeps the 
a, a dear school, but fools will learn and no other. I disagree yeah. with it. I disagree. I disagree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But because but the message, I get it. Right. Because yeah. everybody, everybody's heard this lesson before, right? Everybody's heard this idea before. You know, don't don't chase money or status because it won't make you happy. Like, do the thing that will make you happy now. But I think you still have to go try if you have any interest. Because sometimes you, you can need... only find out that's not going to make you happy by getting. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, the, it, it's like I, another thing I talk about this a lot with is nomading, like being a digital nomad and traveling around the world and living out of your backpack. And that seems really, really cool and sexy until you do it. And then you realize it's really lonely and annoying and like not very fulfilling. And I think it's kind of like an empty promise. But whenever somebody asks me like, hey, you've been kind of critical of digital nomad stuff. Do you think I should just not do it? I always tell them to go do it. Because you need to go find out for yourself. You need to go have the experience and then realize like, oh, okay, that's not actually what I want. And now I can actually focus on what those things really are. I, I feel like the trick is you want to try to have these realizations as quickly as possible. I was talking about this with my friend Kay He, who, you know, he used to work on Wall Street and he talks to a lot of people who work on Wall Street who make these crazy amounts of money and they want to leave to do something more fulfilling, but it takes them, you know, maybe 5, 10, 15 years to get burned out and get there. And I got really lucky in that I kind of speed ran it <laughs> in a year and a half and got some of that, you know, initial financial reward for doing this kind of work and then was able to say, this actually isn't what I want. I do actually want to go back and do the writing thing because there, if you don't actually try and have a little bit of success with it, there is always this question of, okay, is that just sour grapes, right? Are you just trying to convince yourself you don't want it? Or are you just downloading somebody else's story? And I can actually have a lot more conviction around not chasing it because I do know what's at the end of that that journey now. So I, I, I do, you know, I, I disagree with that, that Franklin quote too, because reading you know you could read all of the advice and all the stories in the world and still convince yourself that like you're different <laughs> it's you know the, the, it's not going to apply to you and and so I, I think it is worth going through it so that you you do know so it was worth well first of all you yeah. made money at it right that's one thing yeah to, yeah i mean and, and you find out you what you didn't like or did like when two roads diverge in a wood, sometimes you have to just go down both. You go down, yeah. come back, go down. <laughs> you know, I didn't like and, that you road. Go, you got to make a choice and, and do it. But, but you're, but you also did it a little different than I would think the majority of people that played crypto. It sounded like you were trying to learn something programming mm -hmm. in that space, the technology. It sounded like you had a little bit of, curiosity about how does this work so yeah that in and of itself is a reward regardless of the money to a degree oh how does this work mm -hmm. now i know and then you were also you didn't just trade you had a game and working on something that i i think is maybe still out there and and functional but yeah no, I, but, th but that's really true because yeah it, it could have just been day trading and that wouldn't have been a very interesting story or maybe even a very rewarding journey like you know i i was and I still am extremely excited about crypto's potential in general, but also crypto gaming. You know, I like I know that that's going to be a thing. Somebody's going to get it right. This, this somebody team... needs to rebrand the word crypto. I, it, it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, the, because the term is I'm hearing about the gaming, great idea, but the crypto that that thing has so much, yeah. especially with FTX and everything else. It mm -hmm. it's got a lot of baggage on it. it needs so... a rebrand for sure. Anyway. But yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, no, no. Like that, you know, all that stuff is super exciting. And I I do think that there is so much potential there. And part of what I wanted to do in the book, too, was explain that both of these worlds do exist. There is this shitty, scammy, get rich quick, degenerate gambling side of the crypto industry. And there are all these really cool, really innovative things that are being built that are probably going to become part of our day-to-day -day financial lives faster than a lot of people expect them to. And you kind of need to learn how to tell the difference if you're going to have an honest look at the industry, because you, you don't want to write the whole thing off as just being one big scam or sham, but you also don't want to be this completely like 
rose colored glasses person who thinks that like everything is real and even these like silly meme coins have some important role in our economic system right like you can you can be honest about the good and bad and learn to see the two so another quote from your post if you say something along the lines of don't separate work from life in a way that diminishes either integrate both yeah. to create a harmonious and fulfilling existence I'm assuming you didn't do that to the crypto thing or you did, <laughs> or how would you do it now? I agree with this, yeah. but how do you do that? And could you have done it? I'm being impossible questions, I'm sure. Yeah, no, no, it's a good question. I, for me, I could not have done it during the crypto period because it was so money driven. There's definitely a lot of curiosity and interest and excitement too, but at the end of the day, if you had given me $10 million and said, you can never work on crypto again, I would have said, cool, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have thought about it for half a second. Okay, so but if you gave, yeah, you said a, it's important that you, let me see if you said, I couldn't have done it because it was so money driven. So yeah, so, so for you, if it's overly about the money, you can't be harmonious in work and life. It's certainly for me, I, I wonder if that is a general rule. I've reached that point in my life, Probably. but I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure if I if my younger self could 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 get there. I don't know. Yeah. But I know I, I've done it so many times that I'm it's like not worth it to me, right? But I, but yeah, I don't know I if that's because I have enough money or right. if I'm wiser <laughs> you know, or, or both, right? I mean, I guess as long as the work is primarily aimed at making money, then it's going to be more naturally separated from your sort of like ideal life in, in some way. Yeah, I agree. I, agree. I think it's harder I, for I, it to I guess be maybe that's integrated. the point to the audience. Yeah. Maybe that's the point is like, you, it's a Faustian deal. Yeah, go ahead. If, if, if money is everything... Is that if that's the key to your decision, we're just warning you. There you should be a, a, yeah. a warning sticker on that job. Right. That you know, this could fuck you up in different ways or make you miserable in different ways if that's the only thing. Just go in yeah. there with your eyes open. We're not saying Yeah, don't don't take and the money. I, we're just saying, look, that should have a warning label on it. That that's that you, you'll be surprised. Look. Yes. There, there was a point where I was doing a project. Some guy gave me a ton of money for the, and it, and it was an interesting. I was like, geez, I hated it. I was like, I, yeah. I didn't last six months. It wasn't worth it. Right. It was just totally. all consuming. So and I think sorry. that's, that's yeah. really the lesson I was trying to, or one of the lessons I was trying to get across too, is it's not, it's not like don't play. It's not don't get involved or don't dive in. It's just have a, have a good exit plan or like, you know, be be aware of what it might do to you if you succeed. Know what you're or, diving into. Know yeah, what, know what you're diving into. Yeah, yeah. So if you yeah. catch the car and you're not ready for it, like, could be bad consequences. Yeah. Now we got it. Now we don't know what to do with it. Yeah, because everybody, I I think on the other side of money, or or you know, looking at this hill called money, always think it's just being on top of the hill is better than not. Yeah. Yeah. But there is the possibility it's worse and it's not better. There's, no. <laughs> but people don't, totally. people, people think th they don't think that way. Yeah, but it's very hard to imagine that until you, it's very a hard bit on the hill. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, what else should we say about the book or your experiences or anything else that I haven't asked about? Cause I, I, they should read the book because it, yeah. it's, it, it's <laughs> by the way, it's fast paced. It's you, you wrote, um, you know, the chapters are short, boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom. Cause, and it, and it actually gives you the feel of what you're going through. I, yeah. The, I, I, I thought it, want, as I, I wanted the readers it, to feel a little stressed. <laughs> yes. It's kind of like the bear. You know what I mean? That's yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a little bit. Oh, that, that's such a compliment. Thank you. But had you, had you drug out the chapters, I think that would have been lost, you know, that yeah, because it was like the next day and then this and this, this happened. So that's uh, why I, I pulled out a lot of the explanations to their own mini chapters, because they just interrupted the flow too much to try to weave them into the narrative. And I really wanted, you know, I the one of the things I studied for writing the book was, you know, how does John Grisham write? 
or how do you know like these really exciting fantasy novels like Red Rising? You know, what is that pacing? or Dark Matter by Blake Crouch, right? Like, how how do they structure the story so that you're just boom, 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 you know, turning the page, getting through it? Because, like, a Crypto 101 book would be very boring. But I still wanted people to learn something. And so it was kind of this, this big challenge I gave myself of, could I write something that's as fun and exciting as one of those thriller-esque novels while still having a decent amount of the education baked into it? And I think it did a good job. Like, it's, it's nice to hear that people kind of fly through it. What is your investment thesis currently? Index funds? What are you? Are you? Yeah, I, I still have a good amount of ETH from that time period. And I'm just sitting on that. And, you know, I've sort of been slowly selling it down to pay expenses while I focused on this. But plan to hold that for the long term because I am really just pretty bullish on Ethereum being this, like the new bedrock of the financial system, honestly, uh, which might sound crazy, but having been so in it and seeing a lot of the stuff that's getting built, I, I feel pretty confident about this. This is this cool stuff. Like, you know, BlackRock has launched their, their first tokenized fund where they, they launched a, a coin that is backed by us treasuries. And so you can buy their like treasury coin and it just sits in your wallet and goes up at 5% and you don't have to do anything. And then you can immediately swap that to USDC to pay for things. And Hang on a Coinbase, second. That's there. Hmm? Is, that, is, is that live now? Yeah, they yeah it's live now. It, you, What's it called? It's called the Biddle Fund, B-U-I-D-L. And they have four hundred sixty million dollars in there so far, just wild. That's but wild. we're we're within a year, I'd say, of being in an ecosystem where, if you were, you know, if you wanted to, you could get your paycheck. You can already do this. You can get your paycheck sent straight to Coinbase, and then you could immediately have that in or some of it in USDC on your phone, and then a second later have that in treasuries just compounding at 5%. So, which you and then you could pretty immediately switch back and forth to have to, you know, pay for coffee with it as more merchants start accepting USDC through Coinbase. And so even a simple thing like that where everybody in the world could be walking around with their cash compounding at the US Treasury rate and have that all be actually like backed by money in a bank account somewhere and have it be just as easy to use as a credit card at merchants. Like it's not that far away. It's, it's a lot closer than people think it is. And that's kind of just like one example of how it's starting to get used by these big banks. And that's different to me than the main foray of crypto or even Bitcoin, because that is a layer over something that's pegged to something. There's collateral yeah. behind it. Exactly. So that's a, to yeah. me, that makes it different, very useful. So at the beginning, we talked about, you went through this roller coaster ride and it, it took an emotional toll on you. And it took, you said you got out, it took about a year for you to kind of get your equilibrium. It was hard for you to take on projects without kind of having that reaction. Yeah. And you, I think you said you started meditating, you what were some of the practices that helped you recover from that kind of burnout or reaction to work? Honestly, I kind of tried everything. I was doing therapy for a while. I was doing a decent bit of psychedelics. I was doing a lot of meditation. I was doing a lot of reading, doing a lot of like heavy exercise. You know, I, I trained and did a half Ironman. Um, kitchen sink. Jeez. Yeah. Did, yeah. Kitchen sink. <laughs> it's kitchen sink. Well, it what do you think? Like, okay. Can you pull Anything out what, to feel okay? <laughs> what, what was it that, that the soup kind of helped you or what, can you pull out any of those ingredients that you've thought paid the most dividends as to your recovery mentally, emotionally? Honestly, I think very low dose psychedelics plus meditation was the most helpful because that actually unearthed this unhealthy relationship with work much more than therapy or reading did. The insights came from the those insights, activities. Yeah. That's cool. And, and, and something I stumbled on in that process, but I haven't seen anybody really talk about, and I, I want to write something about this at some point, but, and, you know, this is not medical advice, but I 
it was one of the most helpful things I did is I would do a small dose of mushrooms and then go for a run. And after like three, four, five, six miles, I would stop and then just walk in silence, you know, and I wouldn't bring headphones or anything. And I think the combination of getting super in my body, getting my heart rate up, being in that meditative state of running for a while. Out of your mind, plus, out of your mind, exactly. into your body. Okay. Plus the bit of help from the psychedelics, I would just have these incredibly deep, insightful bits of breakthrough with myself. Mm. And sometimes I would be just like literally sobbing on the side of the trail, like in public, which was... <laughs> oh, that's cool. No, man, that's which, cool. Yeah, Come on. but it, it it helped, you know, it, it really worked. And I got into this point where like, I got crazy deep into the meditation. It got me to this interesting space. And I've actually come back from that a lot because now I feel so much better with my work and feel like, no, I mean, I, I really feel ready to just fully attack the writing stuff and go all in on it. And I want to be in that work mode again. And it's it's a really nice place to be. This is psilocybin. Was it 0.3 grams? Was it low? Dose? Yeah, yeah. It, it was about 0 0.3, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. It was chocolate, so it was a little hard to measure, but it was around that dosage, yeah. What was the meditation technique? Was it breath work? Was it insight practice? What what was there anything special yeah. about? I I tried a few different practices. I got pretty into Tibetan Buddhism for a while and like meta meditations. So loving kindness was extremely helpful. And then a lot more on the Zen train and a mix of like reading Zen koans, reading Taoism, and then just trying to do pretty simple, like focused meditation, aware, you know, like breathing awareness meditation styles. But then also running as meditation, I think, is really underrated. Just going for a tempo run with no music or anything and just seeing what comes up is, I think, almost as powerful as sitting in silence. Ned, this was great. Thank you uh, for sharing. This was, this was a really, really story. fun conversation, Larry. Thank you for having so, me on. So how do they find you? Can you give us all the... And I'll put this in the show notes. Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Crypto Confidential, everywhere books are sold. If you're an audiobook person, I will say the audiobook is great it's really fun i got really into it did you read and, it and uh, yeah yeah i okay. read it right. really really enjoyed it and then aside from that my newsletter or my blog my essay is blog.nataliason.com and then twitter is the social media where i'm most likely to respond to things so just at nataliason on twitter okay i'll put all this in the show notes again thank you so much thank you so much for having know. me on yeah you bet and uh, let's stay in touch thank you let's do it yeah this was great thanks larry okay man cheers talk soon well, that's a wrap. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed it, do share it with your friends and on your social platforms. Big thanks to Sam Williams, my audio guy. And the beautiful bumper music you're hearing is Michael Petrovich's Bella Luna. For all my show notes or resource links, visit LarryWeeks.com and we will talk again soon. Mm -hmm.